preach. Uh, in fact, today's words are hard one. Out of the book. You got a Bible? You got a Bible? In there they got two books called Timothy 1 and Timothy 2. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't want to hear what he's got to say, you don't have to. Whether you're listening on the computer or whether you're listening here, you don't have to listen to it. But I have to say it because this is the Word of God and that's my job. And I have to tell you, and you're going to say, ah, oh, that's back to going back to the old days. They used to do that. Well, maybe so. But that's what it says. And this is what I have to say. I printed it up so I could read it instead of the small print and the bigger one. So I'm going to read it off my notes. But it's in the Word of God. If I have to give this a title, which I will, it says, Living a Godly Life. Living a godly life. You know, God gives you the rules, God gives you the law. But if one thing God does, and He lets you be a sinner. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. God let them disobey him. He could have come down in the middle of the conversation with Satan. Ah, you're not going to eat of that fruit. You didn't do that. They wanted to sin and they sinned. And God said, what did you do? Of course, Adam said, you know that woman you gave me? Put her in the blame, right? She talked me into it. Find somebody else to blame. But you know, God didn't tell Eve, don't eat of the food. He told Adam, That's right. I told you. That's right. I told you. You don't mind, I'm going to take this off here. Praise God. God lets you sin. He told Jonah, go to Nineveh. John said, I'm not going over there. And he got, and he went away. God could have stopped him. He said, hey, 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 that's not where I want you to go. He said, well, I don't want to go over there. So he got on a boat and he goes somewhere else. And things just didn't go right for him. Well, eventually they threw him in the water and a big fish swallowed him. And it wasn't when he found himself inside that fish. He said, well, maybe I should have gone and then it. Maybe I should obey God. In the middle of the fish, he said, Lord, I'm sorry. And the fish made a new turn <laughs> and took him toward Nineveh. But God could have stopped it. When Jesus was on the cross, God could have stopped him from crucifying him. Today, if you want to be a sinner, you can be a sinner. God's not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. If God doesn't stop you, I'm not going to stop you. But I will tell you what the Word of God says. I will tell you. And I'll tell you that if you're a sinner, where are you going to end up? Does anybody know? It's called the lake of fire. It says in Revelation 21 8, but as the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second. But you can be a sinner. Revelation 20, 15, and if anyone's name is not found in the written, not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Some will tell you there's no hell. That's what they call this place, the lake of fire. We don't believe in that. It sounds mean, 
God wouldn't do that. I had an air conditioning instructor once, and we used to ask him questions about fixing air conditioners. He was like, hey, Mr. Martinez, how do you fix it? He goes, look it up in the book. It's in the book. So anytime we ask him, he tell us, look it up in the book. But this is God's book. If you got any questions, look it up in the book. It's there. This is in the book, what I'm telling you. Well, they don't sound nice. I didn't come here to be nice. I come here to tell you what's in the book, what's in God's word. Pastor, that's not like it. No, I don't like doing that. This is my job. I have to tell you what's in the book. I have to tell you what God's word is. Want to walk out? You can read it later. But it's in the book. I'm not making this up. Matthew 13, 42, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be waiting, waiting and gashing of teeth. Second Thessalonians 1 through 28, and in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't like preaching about that. But this is what's in the book. You better know it because you might get up there and say, well, the pastor never told us about these things. Where, did, where, where, where is this? Uh, you're going to start out reading First Timothy. And I'm going to actually read a lot of it. It might, it might sound boring if I read it. But I need to prove to you that this is in the book. I'm not making it up. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy, Timothy was his uh, son in Christ. He brought him to the Lord. And he left him in Ephesus. He left him in Ephesus to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus. At that time, Ephesus belonged to Greece. Today is part of uh, Turkey, what we know as Turkey. I've had the opportunity to go there. And it was in Ephesus that John took care of Jesus' mother. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? Remember reading that? When Jesus on the cross said, Mother, here, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. But John took charge of her. And the last place she lived was in Ephesus. They have a tomb there called the, the tomb of Mary. Mary didn't resurrect. She died. It's not the same. Jesus, had, there was a tomb of Jesus, but he resurrected. He didn't stay there. Anyway, this is what Timothy is being told. And we started with Paul saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father in Christ our Lord. Now verse 3, as I urge you, when I went to Macedonia, stay in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, for, or to devote themselves to men that endless genealogies. Paul is telling Timothy, these people are bringing you false doctrine. Who were these people? They were members of the church. Sometimes we think, oh, oh, well, you know, maybe this is what this means, and we get off into a tangent totally different than what the scripture is talking about. Well, I don't think that's the way it was meant. I don't think that's the way it should have been. No, this is the way it is. It's in black and white. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's word which is by faith. The goal of this commandment 
God's command, the goal is love, which comes from a pure heart and good conscience and sincere faith. What is the total command? Love. If we're teaching you something that's contrary to love, then we're not following it. Some have departed from me and have turned to meaningless talk. You know, I was in a church in Washington, D.C. And it was a whole Pentecostal church. I was sitting back there watching the older men. I guess I'm one of those older men now. Back then I was young. And they were arguing. Really important things. One says, I wonder if I'm going to have a mustache when, I, when Jesus comes for me. And the other one says, yeah, you're going to have it. And the other one says, no, no, we're going to have a glorified body. You don't have hair on a glorified body. And they're arguing with us. And they're getting serious. And one says to the other, you don't know what you're talking about. And the other says, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. No, you don't. Well, let's go outside and settle this. They're ready to go fight outside because they were arguing who had a mustache when Jesus comes again. This same thing was happening back in the old church of Ephesus. Arguing over silly things. Those aren't important. If it isn't edifying the church, don't worry about it. Verse 7 says, they want to be teachers of the law. But they do not know what they're talking about or what they confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if, if one uses it properly. We know that the law is made not for righteous but for lawbreakers. What does that mean? Martin Luther King put it this way. He said, you can't change a person's feelings by making a law. You can't change a man's heart by passing the law. The laws are for those that are heartless, that are mean, that are cruel. This is what the scripture is saying. If you know to love your neighbor, you don't need a law. But if you don't have no love, you need that law to tell you don't kill nobody. Don't bring a false witness. You need that law to put you in your place. That's what happens. For the lawbreakers and rebels and ungodly and sinful and unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders, for liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that confirms to the gospel concerning the glory. Blessed God, which he entrusted. Pastor, you're, uh, you're saying things that are very controversial. It's in the Bible. If, it's, if the Bible says it's bad, guess what? It's bad. If God doesn't agree with it, guess what? God doesn't agree with it. I'm not making these things up. You still got that book open? First Timothy? Find it yourself. It's in the book. Now, I said a little while ago that God lets you be a sinner. That's what you want to be. I agree. Jesus Christ died on the cross that you could be saved, that you could have eternal life. If you choose not to have that, you have that right. God has given it to you. I'm not going to put you in jail because of it. I'm not going to crucify you. God will take care of you at the end. But if you want eternal life, you want to be something different, you want to feel God's love in your heart, you have to accept Jesus Christ. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man, I will show mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul 
thought he was being a real good religious man. And he persecuted the church. And he went around killing the Christians, the followers of Christ, those that belong to the way. He thought he was doing something good. Finally, Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He said, Paul, oh, why are you trying to kill me? Why? Why are you trying to do this? He knocked him off his horse, literally, and blinded him. That's right. But you know, Jesus, I mean, Paul said, he had mercy on me. He didn't just say, okay, Paul, you're trying to kill my followers. Now I'm going to really get you. He said, no, I love you. I, 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 like, I like the way you are, Paul. You just got to change a few things. First of all, you need to accept that I am Jesus, your Savior. Second, you don't kill people. You got to show love. You got to show that you care. He went through a while learning more of the Word of God. But this was a man who studied the Word, the, the prophets uh, writings. But now he had to change the way he was. Verse 14 of the first chapter says, The grace of our Lord was poured out on him abundantly along with the faith and love of our Lord Christ Jesus. Here is trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Amen. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might displace his immense patience as an example for those who believe in him and receive eternal life. Now, to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. See, finally, he says, now he goes a little further and he's talking to Timothy, remember? In Ephesus, he's the pastor. He's got to get some things straight. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle of wild. You need to fight, stay in there, holding on to faith and good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regards to the faith. What do you mean by that? There were some people, and particularly two, that, that had gone silent, gone away from the faith. And he calls them by name. How would you like to be known in history as the guy that got it all wrong? Yeah. I'll tell you who's famous was the mule that carried Mary. He was famous. What did he do? He carried Mary. And he'll go into history as a servant faithful, right? He carried Mary before she had Jesus. He was just a donkey. But here are two men in the church that were believers that are shipwrecked. What happens when a ship wrecks? It hits the ground, makes a hole. Water gets in it. No good. You got it all wrong. You can't sail anymore. You can't go anymore. And Paul is talking about two members in his church, two leaders that have just gone shipwreck. One of them, one of them is called Hymenaeus and the other one Alexander. They got it wrong. And he said, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. He let the devil take care of him. Do God's dirty work there, huh? The devil could be pretty mean if you give him a chance. That's not what you want. You better show love. But and I'll tell you what, what it was that they did wrong. They were teaching the church that Jesus, already, Jesus had already come. The rapture already had taken place. There's some religion today that preached that. 
that the rapture already happened. And they're going door to door. They think they're among the 144,000 that, that the Revelation talks about. That's what these two gentlemen were, were teaching. They were teaching that Jesus already came. And Paul said, you guys got it wrong. They're shipwrecked. What he doesn't say is how Satan took care of it. So then he goes on to teach them that look, this is what you got to do. You got to get it right. He says, I urge them first of all that petitions and prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all the people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully, quiet lives, and godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. We want all the people to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all the people. This has now been witnessed to at all the proper time. And for the purpose I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying and true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Lifting up holy hands without anger. But you don't know my neighbor. Lifting up holy hands without anger. But you don't know, that guy just ran me off the road. But you don't know my mother in law. You don't know my sister in law. You don't know my boss. All these people get me angry. I'm really a nice guy, unless they get me angry. Or disputing. I had a friend years ago. He said, You know, I got the most nicest wife. She's an angel, she's a sweetheart. Don't get her mad. Don't get her mad. Because she's like a tiger. I said, well, that's normal. And yes, normally, yes. She's always mad. She's always mad. I wasn't talking about you. I said, the guy I knew. It says, therefore, I want a man everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or dispute. I want the women to dress them up. Well, now I'm going to get in trouble with them. You want to tear this book out? Go ahead. And answer to God. Says, I want the women to dress modestly, with decency, propriety, adorn themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or peers or expensive clothes. Well, with good deeds appropriate for women who would profess to worship them. Now, I belong from years back, I belong to churches that took that to the extreme. You couldn't, women couldn't wear makeup, we couldn't wear earrings, women couldn't wear any kind of jewelry, whether a wedding band. They uh, had to dress. And this is they would say old fashioned. And they they took it to extremes. They wouldn't let the woman wear pants. Uh, even before my time, if, you, if a woman wore socks, it was a sin. They took it all to the extreme. I'm not here to tell you to do that, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. And if you didn't like what I just read, you're not going to like what I'm going to read further. But it's written in the book, okay? I have to read it. So make sure you're not, no rocks, no tomatoes, okay? <laughs> A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. 
She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing. And if they continue in faith, love, and holy by parity. Okay. I'm not telling you this. Back then, women didn't work in the out in the field. We're in different times. So I have to tell you what it says. Okay. The very capable of women, more capable than some men or of men, stronger, smarter. You know, they fly jets, they fly airplanes, and then I'm convinced they could do anything a man can do. And even more. So, you don't have an argument here, okay? I'm just telling you what God tells you. Now that, that I got myself in trouble saying these things, I'm going to go on to the qualifications of an overseer or a deacon. See, Paul is talking to this church because some of the members went shipwrecked, went haywire, coming up with their own ideas. So he had to set them all straight. So, chapter 3. Hear the trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer, that's like a, a supervisor of the church, desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. I mean, we shouldn't have to be telling you doing something wrong. Faithful to his wife. I didn't name him for the women on that one. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. What? He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He was not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation as outsiders, so he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. That's a good guy. Not just in the church, outside the church. In the same way, Deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. What is dishonest gain? You're cheating somebody out of their money. You cannot come here and say, I love Jesus, but, you know, I'm going to falsify this, I can get more money. Not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep a hold of the deep truth and the faith with a clear conscience. I had a fellow once tell me that a conscience is like a, a triangle in a square. And every time that triangle spins, it knocks up against the square. And every time it knocks, takes a chip off that triangle and it does it again it takes a little chip. Eventually that triangle becomes a circle and then spins in the square. It doesn't bother you anymore. They must be first tested and then if nothing against them, is it, then if there is nothing against them, Veteran service deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate, 
trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellence. To get to heaven, you've got to serve Jesus Christ. This is to call yourself a Christian. This is to live a godly, a godly life. I'm not closing the doors to heaven. There's only one way in, and that's to Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you what's in the book. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing these instructions so that I am, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar, the foundation of the truth, beyond all question and mystery then, from which the true Godliness brings its great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, and was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Chapter 4. The Spirit clearly says that in the later time, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Oh, you got to go to counseling. The reason you feel guilty because you think it's wrong. Well, just don't think it's wrong. That's the counseling they give you. Oh, you'll be okay. Just, you know, don't, don't let it bother you. Be happy. That's what they counsel you. No. He said, you did something wrong. You need to repent. If they're teaching you it's okay, then it's wrong. It's not okay to lie. It's not okay to cheat. It's not okay to steal. It's not okay. Such, te such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been sheared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry in order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Everybody wants to attack the Big Mac, the Whopper Burger. You can't eat that. That's bad for you. Don't eat that. You know, the scripture says, just pray and be grateful God has given you food. Pray for it. Jesus is not what goes in your mouth this bad is what's coming out. They tell me at home, don't be eating that ice cream. I'm not convinced it's bad for me. Because I really enjoy sitting there watching the news. I think the news is bad for me. But the ice cream's awesome. Yes. We have to listen to our professionals. We have to take things in moderation. We got to watch what we eat. But when in doubt, pray about it. Because what you're taking today, they tell you, oh, no, this is good for you. Tomorrow they'll tell you it's causing cancer. For everything God created is good. God made the heavens and the earth and he saw that it was good. He saw he made the fish and the bird, and he said he saw he saw it was good. Who are you to call it bad? Pray for it. Lord, bless this food. Make it nourish my body. And thank you. And help those that don't get to eat this ice cream for it. Just let them have their own. Whatever it is, be grateful. God created for everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Pastor, all your people that listen to you are going to die of heart failure. Mother, the word says pray for it. Be grateful. If you point these things out, to the brothers and sisters, 
you will be a good minister. Hey, I'll be a good guy if I tell you this. What it says. Be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Nourish the truth of the faith and good teaching that you have followed. How long has it been since somebody told you what you're eating is good for you? Everybody's always telling you all the stuff you're eating. The medication that you're that you're taking last week, I'm gonna hurt you today. You know, if you gotta take medication, take it to the Lord. Make it good for my body. And of the good teachings that you have followed have nothing to do with godless men, old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has a value for all things, holding promise to both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full self. He says, do exercise is God. Physical training is good. Living a godly life does you better. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. You ever notice that when it rains, it rains on everybody? He doesn't say, oh, no, no, that's why I hope. It wasn't behaving. Don't, worry, don't let it rain on him. Brings on everybody. When we go to the fountains to bring water, the water doesn't ask you questions. You drink it and nourishes you. You say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the water. Command and teach me things. This is what the Spirit tells me. It's telling me that I have to tell you this. Well, Pastor, we don't want to hear that. You don't have to, but it's in the book. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But be, but set an example for the believers in speech, conduct, and love, and faith, and purity. So I come. Devote yourself to the reading of the reading. Devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture. To preach, to teach. Do not neglect your gift, which was given. Through prophecy in the body of elders, they handed it. It's telling me, I have to tell you this. I asked the Lord when I'm going to my turn to preach, Lord, what do you want me to tell you? The people, what is it you want? He's already telling me, why are you asking? He's already telling me what I got to tell you. The Lord, they don't want to hear that. Praise the Lord and go home. They don't want to hear they have to change their life. They don't want to hear that they have to love the neighbor. They don't want to hear that they can eat whatever they want if God blesses them. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Preserve in them. Because if you do, you will say well, both yourself and others that hear you. Chapter 5. Widows, elders, and sin. Do not rebuke an older man harshly. I like that one. I'm that old man. <laughs> Be nice to that old fella. That's what it's saying. Be nice to him. You agree with that, Brother Johnny? Amen. Robert, you back there? <laughs> Be nice to that old fellow. But exhort him as if he was your father. Talk to him right. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. Take care of your own folks. Take care of them. 
But this is pleasing God. The widow who was really in need and left all alone went to her home. And God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead, even while she lives. Give the people these instructions. What's it telling me? Give the people these instructions. I have to tell you this. So that no one may be open to blame. I didn't know. Now, you know now. Okay? You know. Pastor, I didn't really like to preach like that. I don't. But it's telling me I have to say it. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worth than an unbeliever. What? Well, need money? Who oh, pray to God? Who okay. bless? No, what he said, take that money out and give it to them. Take care of them. They're part of your family. Do it for strangers. Oh, they got food stamps. That's not what he said. They got the Lone Star card. That's not what he said. We have a pantry. We're following it, right? We care. Now, back then, the, the church took care of the widows, and this is what he's talking about. No widow may be put on the list of widow on the list. She's over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, hospitality but washing of the feet of Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. This is the widow, the one who has nothing you gotta be a nice person too. As for younger widows, do not put them on that list. Because why not draw a high? What it's saying. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to. They want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about house to house. Not only do they become idle, but dizzy bodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel young widows to marry and to have children and manage their homes and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Pastor, we don't, we don't do that. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman, and if a believer has a widow in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them so the church can help those widows who are really in need. Pastor, I don't know all that stuff, in there. Now you know. Now you know. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, those whose work is preaching and teaching. Whereas the scripture says, do not muzzle the, muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. The worker deserves his wages. What does that mean? That means the preacher should get paid. The Lord has blessed me. I don't ask for pay. George don't ask for pay. But it says that we should get paid. The Lord has been paying us. We're not going to let pay. The Lord is taking care of it. When he talks about the ox, they used to tie uh, the ox to a rope and he would walk on the grain and crush it. And some of them would put something over the mouth covering so that he wouldn't eat the grain. They don't do that to the ox. The ox is crushing the grain. Let him eat some. That's what it's talking about. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that others can take care of Pastor, you're going to embarrass him? That's what he says, right? Embarrass him, maybe he'll change. 
I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions not partial, partially empty, and to do nothing out of favoritism. We're not going to just tell some people, oh, we don't want to offend the brother who pays tithe. We don't want to offend the brother. He says, offend them all the same way. If you're doing what you got to do, do it. In the name of Jesus. But do it with love, right? Do not be hasty in laying on the hands. Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water. You're going to say, what? Use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. The pastor's telling us to drink wine. I'm not telling you drink wine. The Bible. That's what they make coffee medicine, alcohol. Back then, that was medicine. They used that to help people. Of course, some people would like to get a lot of help. That's not what it's about. Some people use this verse to justify drinking and going to get drunk. Don't do that. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious. And even those that are obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Or obvious, or not obvious, cannot remain hidden forever. Almost finished here. Almost finished. But I have to say, the Bible says I have to tell it. If you're feeling a little hot under the collar, it's not because of what I'm telling you. It's because the air conditioner is not working right. <laughs> All who are under the yoke of slavery. Now it talks about slavery. That was something practiced back then. All who are under the yoke of slavery should be considered the master full of respect. So that God's name or teach may not be slandered. Those of you who have believed, master should not show them disrespect just because they follow the leaders. Instead, they should serve them even better because the masters are dear and follow them. As fellow believers and are devoted to the Lord. We can insert that master and slave thing as employer, employee. Honor your employer. They're providing for you. Work for them like you, you care for them. Do the most. I know when I was a supervisor, there was a lot of guys slacking up. And I started demanding work from them. I said, you get paid for a whole day, work the whole day. Well, how much is enough work? Work the whole day. That's what you get paid for. Don't do a little bit and go home. That's not what you're getting paid. If you're doing that, you're wrong. If you're cheating your employer, you're wrong. Okay, you heard it here, okay? I don't expect to get the phone call from your employer. False teachers and the love of money. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise, and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to behold God the teaching. They are conceited and understanding nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Oh, well, I come to church, so God will bless me. Because no. Paul says, whether I'm rich or poor, I'm going to serve God. I've learned to, to live in the good, and I've learned to live in the poor. It doesn't matter. I'm going to serve God. And that's what he says. It's not about money. But godliness with content is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. 
But if we but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Did you know that the suits that they put on the corks and they put them in the coffin don't have pockets? Why? You don't have to take anything with you. Your money can't go with you. There's no U-Haul trailers on the back of the hearse. You ain't taking anything with you. One pastor said, do your giving while you're living. But when you're dead, you don't know who's going to get that car you just bought. You don't know who's going to keep your house. You want to give somebody something good while you're alive. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered off from the faith and pierced themselves, pierced themselves with many griefs. What does it say? The root of all, the money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. And some might even say, no, bro, it's the lack of money. <laughs> I wouldn't have to steal if I want to have money. Chances are if you're stealing, you'd have it even if you had money. They asked the rich man, how much is enough money? He said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. It's in the Bible. It's in the book. I'm not making any things up. It's a good time to change your attitude. It's a good time to read Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 through 6. We're almost finished. Here. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Be nice. To put it some, to some, be nice. Fight the good fight of faith. 